turn to 89.7 FM and listen to us on the radio uh, or watch us on Facebook Live in your car. But uh, let's start off our morning this uh, with our worship with hymn number 235. That's Come Sing, Ye Choirs Exultant. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Join me in singing, Worthy is the Lamb. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you declare your almighty power chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Grant us the fullness of your grace, that we, running to obtain your promises, may become partakers of your heavenly treasure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? The word of the Lord. The psalm appointed for today is uh, Psalm 78, verses 1 through 4 and 12 through 16. Uh, if you have a prayer book, that's found on page 694. Other, otherwise, you can uh, see the psalm printed in your bulletin. We'll say the psalm together. Hear my teaching, O my people. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will declare the mysteries of ancient times. That which we have heard and known and what our forefathers have told us. We will not hide from their children. We will recount to generations to come the praiseworthy deeds and the power of the Lord and the wonderful works he has done. He worked marvels in the sight of their forefathers, in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zion. He split open the sea and let them pass through. He made the waters stand up like walls. He led them with the cloud by day and all the night through with a glow of fire. He split the hard rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as from the great deep. 
He brought streams out of the cliff, and the waters gushed out like rivers. A reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, what do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And you, even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, very good morning uh, to you. Uh, good morning to those of you in the parking lot. Uh, I was uh, talking uh, to one of you this morning, and, and we were both uh, expressing gratitude over the fact that starting the very first week of July, and here we are, almost October, and this is the first Sunday that it's actually raining a little bit, which is, I, I, am, I, I am grateful for that. It's been quite the run, but all good things must come to an end, and here we are. It's a little bit, it's a little bit uh, wetter than I'd like, uh, but it's not too bad. The wind is calm. You look snug in your cars, and it's a privilege to be with you here in the parking lot. Those of you joining from home, it's a, a, a joy to have you tuning in, whether you're here in Lawrence or you're really around the world. Uh, we trust that God is the one who knits our hearts together, and so um, it's just a, a privilege and a joy to be worshiping worshiping with all of you uh, this morning. Um, thought I'd start off talking to you this morning uh, about an essay I ran across, a really interesting essay. Uh, it's about the Latin phrase, carpe diem. Now, if this were a normal congregation, I'd ask you, what does that mean? But I can't hear you. So uh, I think we can all agree. We, uh, typically, when we hear carpe diem, we translate that as seize the day. A lot of us, I'm assuming, became familiar with the phrase carpe diem after watching the iconic 1989 hit film Dead Poets Society starring Robin Williams. I saw some heads shake in cars, so you're tracking with me. That's great. Uh, we all remember that film, right? Most of us remember that film. 
in it, Williams plays a, a, a charismatic teacher by the name of John Keating, uh, who inspires his students at a fictional boarding school in 1950s Vermont. What made uh, Dead Poet Society so iconic from the very beginning was that uh, several of its scenes They're scenes that most of us, I'm assuming, can remember to this very day. Um, myself, I, I remember uh, vividly that scene where Williams, uh, Robin Williams encourages his students to, to rip out the introductions to their textbooks. Uh, I'm not going to lie, that scene of all those students ripping out the introductions to their poetry textbooks, it always struck me as a little wasteful. Uh, this was like 10 years before eBay. So I'm not going to judge him too harshly, and yet I'm thinking to myself, can't that be sold? And then you go to McDonald's with your friends? I mean, that just seems kind of uh, uh, a little counterintuitive, but um, there it is. Uh, I also remember that scene where William stands on his desk, right? I think we remember that one. And he invites his students to come and stand on his desk as well, and, he, and he's trying to teach them in that moment the value of seeing the world through a different perspective. What I remember most, though, is that famous scene, and this is why I'm going to connect it to, to uh, the essay that I read, um, where uh, Williams gathers his students in one of the school's hallways, and he introduces them to the well-known Robert Herrick poem, To the Virgins, To Make Much of Time. In this scene, Williams and the 20-some boys in his class. They're surrounded in this hallway by vintage photographs of generations gone by. And surrounded as they are by the young men that preceded them, Williams explains that the core idea behind that poem is expressed in the Latin phrase, carpe diem, seize the day. What Williams does is he, he argues that uh, seizing the day is so important because the human condition is one of mortality. Williams says that because it's the fate of all humans to, quote, become food for worms, it's imperative that we make our lives extraordinary. Carpe diem, Williams whispers in his Students' ears again and again, seize the day, carpe diem, seize the day. Part of why the Dead Poets Society became so quickly iconic and so quickly became a part of the American imagination is that uh, our culture loves the idea of seizing the day. To understand this, just look at the countless proverbs and cliches our culture uses to express that very idea. Grab the bull by the horns. Strike while the iron is hot. Fortune favors the bold. Or more recently, you only live once. So let me return to the essay that I started off this morning mentioning to you. Uh, the, the essay argued, and it's a really interesting one, I recommend it to you, that there's something ironic about this affection for carpe diem, because the translation seize the day is actually not all that accurate. If you go back to the original context that carpe diem was used, it actually means something more like harvest the day, as in cherish the moment so long it lasts. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, our culture prefers to conceive of life as something that must be seized, exploited, grabbed. I suspect this is because of our culture's rather hyper-competitive nature. After all, we hear day after day that life is a zero-sum game. We're convinced that 
What we seize depends on what those around us are seizing. And therefore, we have to do something extraordinary if we ever want to elevate ourselves above the rest. Culture tells us, do you want to be somebody? Then seize something. Seize or be left behind. While uh, our culture's love for this idea, carpe diem, is obviously a, an innocent thing, I still, though, was struck this week at how different it is from the image of Jesus portrayed to us in this morning's epistle reading. This morning we heard from Paul's letter to the Philippians, the epistle of joy. But before the epistle gets to joy, it talks about unity. And it talks about the great example of our unity, Jesus himself. Now, this morning's passage from Philippians also happens to be one of the absolute most famous and uh, well-known and best-loved passages in the whole of the New Testament. It's actually a hymn, most likely a hymn. Words, therefore, that would have been familiar to those very first listeners in the city of Philippi, eagerly awaiting news from the Apostle Paul. There must have been some discord in their midst because Paul, in this morning's text, starts off by encouraging his hearers to be united in the gospel. Now, according to Paul, the key to this unity is humility. He instructs his listeners to regard others as better than themselves. Before I really go any further, I, I want to make a simple observation about Paul's command to consider others better than yourselves. Paul's words are very, very, very difficult. After all, human instinct is to do the absolute opposite of what Paul is commanding this morning. We humans are hardwired to size up everyone that we meet. We're hardwired to compare ourselves favorably to others. We're hardwired to think of ourselves as worth more respect, more recognition, more acknowledgement than the people we're surrounded by. And as a result of all this, because of the condition we humans find ourselves in, to try and create a community founded not on self-interest, not on self-glorification, but rather on mutual care, it's difficult. More than difficult, I would say it's impossible. It's a task too difficult for us to accomplish. As I've mentioned before, though, Christians really aren't called to create community. Church isn't something that we build. Rather, we're called to receive community. And we receive it from the one who modeled for us genuine humility. It's for this reason that Paul follows up this instruction with that hymn that I mentioned a second ago. It's a hymn that's devoted to the unspeakable, unimaginable humility of Jesus. I mean, Paul writes that even though Jesus was in the very form of God, he didn't regard equality with God as something to be exploited, something to be grasped, something to be seized, you might say. But rather, Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in human likeness. Now, depending on, on how familiar you are with the book of Philippians, these words might be very familiar to you. They might be comforting to you. You might know them well. You might, know, might not know them very well at all. Regardless of your relationship to this text, 
I want all of us to stop for just a second and try and, and, and to consider just how earth-shattering these words are. What Paul is saying is that Jesus, the eternal Son of God, was willing to lay aside the glory of heaven in order that he might take on human flesh, flesh that was contingent, vulnerable, mortal. And more than just take on human flesh, Jesus lived his life in a single act of unceasing humility. The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, he once said. But Jesus, the creator of the universe, the one who spoke into existence all that we see and touch and we hear, had no place to lay his head. Jesus reached out his arms to lepers. He washed the feet of his friends. He allowed himself to be nailed to a tree. Jesus emptied himself completely. One thing that I want to clarify this morning, and this is important when you're trying to, to think theologically about the incarnation, the idea of God taking on human flesh. When we talk about the Son of God emptying himself, we don't mean that he stopped being God by becoming incarnate. He didn't trade the reality of being God for the reality of being human. Our only hope, in fact, is in this. The one that did the things I just mentioned, the one who touched the sick, and washed the feet of disciples, the one who was nailed to a tree. He was so much more than just another human being. He was not just like you or I. The result, therefore, of this fact is that instead of the self-emptying love of Jesus somehow standing in tension, with our understanding of who God is. The self-emptying love that we see in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus reveals who God is. It was the Son of God that did all those things. It was the Son of God who emptied himself completely. And so rather than being sentimental or shallow, we see in Jesus that God's love is cruciform and profound. God's love gives itself away. It doesn't revel in its own power. It doesn't look at the world in order to survey what can and cannot be exploited. God's love doesn't grasp. God's love doesn't cease. No, contrary to all these things, God's love offers itself to our world, all for the sake of love and healing. Getting that out of the way, I want to turn to really the $64,000 question this morning, which is this, how do we go about imitating this? To start, I want to offer a caution, a signpost, if we want to walk the same road of humility that Jesus once walked 2,000 years ago. We have to understand what humility means. After all, our, our culture doesn't deal well with humility. Our culture is quick to dismiss it. It's quick to think of humility as self-deprecation or self-abasement. And yet, let's look again at the life of Jesus, and let's understand this basic fact. The same one who let himself be nailed to the tree also overturned tables in the temple. Jesus was never self-deprecating. He knew exactly who he was. He didn't submit to pain and suffering needlessly or wantonly. He didn't think of it as just his lot in life. 
He didn't think of it as bad luck or misfortune. The reason for this is that the love and the care of Jesus Christ was never inward. He wasn't self-focused. Rather, Jesus was ceaselessly attentive to the other. First, through the love that he had for his father, together with his tender compassion for all those who were around him. That's the way of humility. Friends, to empty oneself in the way that Paul is describing this morning is really to be two things. It's to be attentive to and vulnerable before God. To empty oneself is therefore to be deeply attentive to Jesus, who shows us that life is not defined by what we grab, but rather by by what we give up. And being attentive to Jesus, we can then turn to God in vulnerability, asking that God do that same exact work in us. This, of course, is painful, difficult work. Every inclination, every instinct of the human heart tells us that we're the center of all there is tells us that it's our projects that matter most, tells us that life is a matter of what we seize. And so it's painful work to ask God to turn our gaze from that which is inward to that which is focused on the other. But that work also might just save your life. That work is a life-saving act of grace. I say that because in contrast to the Dead Poets Society, human, human's destiny, the destiny of humanity, is so much more than being food for worms. My friends, that is not the end. That is not why we're called to make the most of our days. Because of Jesus, we actually can have hope for life beyond the grave. Because of Jesus, we can have hope for life now. God is ready to do this work in us. God is ready to walk with us down the path of humility. God is ready to build a new community in our midst, built on self, on, not on, on the self, but on love. By God's grace, self-giving love, mutual care, mutual support can roll down like a mighty river. Forgiveness and grace can roll in our midst like the rain that's falling in our parking lot. And so my prayer is a, is a very simple one. I, I would want for each of us to open our hearts to God. I pray that each of us empty ourselves before him, trusting that the life that God will share with us will far exceed, far exceed the emptiness that we offer before him. Far exceed anything we might dream, taking us to a place of love and sacrifice and care far beyond what we might ever imagine. Amen. If you have a prayer book, I'm going to invite you to turn to page 358 of the Book of Common Prayer and let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, which can also be found uh, in your bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, 
God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the people, form three. Uh, we will pray together. That can be found on page 387 of the Book of Common Prayer as well as your bulletin. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. St. Margaret continues to pray for our church, our nation, and the world. We pray especially at this time for those in our community in need of healing. Earl, Kathy, Sandy, Peter, Anne. We pray also for those in our community in need of strength and guidance. Corbin, Galen, Rob, Connor. We pray for those who have died. Curtis Burns. Special prayer for our ministry, Corinne, to stay safe and well. Heavenly Father, you've promised to hear what we ask in the name of your Son. Accept and fulfill our petitions, we pray, not as we ask in our ignorance, nor as we deserve in our sinfulness, but as you know and love us. In your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins for our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Feel free to share a sign of peace from across the parking lot. There we go. Uh, the Eucharist will continue. Uh, for those of you uh, who feel uh, bold to uh, come forward uh, after the, the prayer, uh, feel free to do so. I understand it's, uh, the timing is not ideal, but uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll make our way forward. Um, so uh, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
A little, a little, early. no, 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 no. I, I need to say the prayer. So back, back in the car. If you know, it, it's gonna be a couple minutes. This Eucharist is offered to the glory of God and in thanksgiving for, for nature and God's great gift of creation. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus Christ. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Margaret, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our, sac- our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia.
These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. For those who are feeling bold, you are welcome to come forward for the Eucharist at this time. I understand if it's a little wet and, uh, and uh, you won't be able to join us. But for those who are so interested, I do invite you to come forward and participate in the Eucharist in this moment. We were the word at the beginning. beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King what a beautiful name it is nothing compares to this what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus heaven without us so Jesus you brought heaven down your sin was great your love was greater what could separate us now what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Jesus Christ my King what a beautiful name it is nothing compares to this what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the Yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ my King. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is the name of Jesus. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. Well, St. Margaret's, uh, this is not what the weatherman ordered, 
But you know what? You amaze me. You are such a committed and wonderful community. Drive home safely, uh, and we will see you next week. Bye for now.